again. Okay, got it. Sorry. Um, a lot has happened and we're back into more disruption. So thank you for attending us via Zoom. Right. Oh, so the first item is apologies, which we've had from Andrew and his worship. Um, no conflicts of interest from my part. None from the others. Okay. No. Confirmations of the minute of the last meeting, which was held all that last year on the 6th of December. I'm taking it as read. And are there any uh, matters arising from it? No. I ju just wondered how we got on with the lucerne, lucerne crop, but I guess are you going to report on that, race? Yeah, we can talk about that partially in the um, through the agenda. Okay, thank you. That would be sort of in your report, I think, Reese, wouldn't it? Okay. Probably more in the financial element, to be honest. Okay. Um, but I'll, Danielle will put presentations on the financials and I'll just talk to bits as we go through it. Okay, so the recommendation at the minutes of the meeting held on Monday the 6th be um, confirmed as true and correct? Yeah, I'm happy to move. Thank you, Christine. Second. Right over the second agenda item is the financial reports. So the good news or the sideways news from you, Danielle. So I'll just start sharing my screen. And if I just turn my video off. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so I guess, um, so this is just page 10 of the agenda. Um, if we look at the non-financial performance objectives, we've achieved all but the cash flow target, um, which isn't much of a surprise um, because the bank balance has reduced over this period. So I'll cover that a bit more soon. Um, the aircraft movements. So these are actually slightly up from December last year, but we've had a drop in the scheduled airlines, um, obviously with the COVID. So there's an uh, increase in the private operations and the helicopters, but a decrease in parachuting as well. And if we get to the actual financials, so um, for the profit and loss, or the surplus and deficit, sorry, um, we've got a loss of 181,000 for six months to December 2021. This is 22K worse than last year. Um, and also 12k lower than SOI. Um, I'll go through in more detail each of the kind of items um, when I go through the notes. And same with the equity. Um, so net assets is 17,673,000. And again, I'll go through this detail in the notes. It's just a bit easier to follow. So the statement of cash flows, um, we've got an operating cash flow from operating activities of a ne negative 78K. Um, we sold the ute, the old ute back, um, back in November, I think it was, for 12K. So that gives you a negative 66K kind of over our operating activities. Um, but we were owed 58K of GST relating to the project. So Really, the drop in the operating cash balance is 8K for, from June to December. Um, so not too bad, um, considering all the COVID lockdowns and things. Um, we've spent $1.7 million on the project, and we've had equity injection of $3 million. So that's given us a $1.1 million increase. Um, is there any questions on the cash flow? No, I think um, we'll probably find that it's been a, a blinder for the aircraft movements over the summer. So we've gone into summer not too bad. So I think we should come out of it not too bad. Yeah, January is looking really good. Um, but obviously, yeah, it's not included in this, which is <laughs> yeah, exactly. unfortunate. Yeah. Um, anything else? No. Okay, cool. Um, so this is just all the accounting policies. So that's all standard. Just skip through that. 
Um, so if we look at the revenue, so total revenues um, between the two is 206. So this is slightly higher than um, December last year, but 26K less than um, SOI. Um, obviously, with the COVID lockdowns, our landing fees and terminal fees have reduced, so they're 30K lower than the prior year. Um, this has mostly been offset with the other revenue line. So this has got the 12K gain in sale of the ute. Um, and we've also included um, insurance proceeds from the investigations for the prop strike back in July. We haven't actually received this money yet, but Bruce is following us up with an insurance company. So hopefully we will, but just a, yeah, I guess a note that this is accrued and not received. Um, the lease revenue is also 25K higher than last December. So this will have an element of uh, CPI increases and also valuation increases. Um, all valuations increasing the rent. So that's, yeah, kind of offsetting all our negative bits up in the landing phase and terminal passenger phase. Um, any questions on the revenue? No. Okay. The, the um, answer to the insurance will cover off um, some of the operating expenditure. I think we, there was, I had a question on that, but I think you've just answered that. Yeah. yeah. Are, we, are we all um, just au fait with, with that insurance process and what, what came about? Any questions on that? Are we all happy? No, I, I, yeah, I think we're au fait with what happened. Yeah, we are. I, yeah. Oh. Um, so with the operating expenditure, so we've got a total expenses including depreciation of 387000 So this is 12K better than SOI. Um, 8K is due to leave taken during the year, which gives a credit to the p and um, Total, so it's, hold, oh, sorry, it's higher than total cost um, the prior year um, due to We've had some grass runway maintenance maintenance of about 10k late last year. Um, and also the aeronautical study that we had back in kind of September, October was 35k. Um, compared to last year, we had the obstacle obstacle limitation survey, which only cost about 15k. Um, and a bit more in the valuation cost because it was the runway um, and roading valuations. Um the accident investigation costs of so the 8.7k is in professional services lines, this 55k here. Um, so yeah, that's offset obviously with the income above, but it just makes it look quite a bit higher. So that's also got the aeronautical study in that line, so that's why that's quite a bit higher than the prior year. Um, I think they're the, the main items. Yeah, sorry. The software licenses? Yes, yeah, so um, this equipment hire here, you can see that's quite a bit lower. So we get the net service um, kind of weather data, would you call it, Reese? Yeah, so this is for our yeah. AWIP system. So it's the, the information published to pilots through our AWIP, and we yeah. obviously have a MAT service site at the airport there. Yeah, so that last year was included in equipment hire and now it's um, up in software licenses. So we've, we've got a new financial system. So we're kind of using different codes and things are mapping a little bit differently. So things are kind of jumping up and down, but um, yeah, they're mostly offset, those two lines. <coughs> it's probably a better place being software licenses because yeah. we're not really hiring yeah. equipment as such. It's yeah. probably more true um, being where it is now. Okay. Um, any other questions? All, no, all in all, not a bad result through a difficult time. Um, so equity note, um, the main bit here is just kind of the capital injection. So this is just um, the flow and effect of the PGU funding for the project, um, 250 from TDC and 2.7 from the Crown. Um, and again, there's not much movement here because this is all more year-end sort of stuff. Um, cash and cash equivalents. Um, but no, this is actually a typo, so that should be five. Um, where did I write it down? 
five six five. Um, okay. So the most of the five point seven million obviously relates to the project fund, um, and it leaves an operating cash balance of one hundred sixteen k. But of this fifty three relates to the GST that needs to be paid transferred back to the project fund. IRD likes to pay me on the last day of the month um, and inflates the operating cash balance, which is not very helpful, but that's nice. Um, so the true operating cash balance is about 70K. Um, so we're still in credit. That's what yes, we're Yes, yeah, yeah. And I'll do a um, cash flow update later. So um, trade and trade receivables. So... Um, where is it? Down here, you can see that kind of that historic olden number has dropped because of all the debt collection efforts that happened earlier in the year. Um, the majority of the other receivable is GST. And there's probably not much else really there. Um, trade and other payables. So the 549 is mostly project related costs. So of that 460 is relating to project expenses for December. And um, we've also got 50K owing to TDC. Um, and this is just allowing for us to, so once we've got the funds, we will have to pay them, but it's kind of just making our cash flow a little bit nicer, I guess. Um, but yeah, we are accruing that what we owe them. Um, and that's, about it. Was there any questions on either of the receivables or payables? Not for me. Thank you. Um, employee benefit liabilities, so that hasn't changed too much. Still quite a big balance there. Um, and that is the end of financial. So I guess, is there any questions? Do you want me to go back to any part? Or are you happy? I'm comfortable. Are you girls comfortable? Yep, I yeah. am. Yeah. The, the annual leave accruals, obviously, that's a liability. Um, are, are we working through that, race? Yeah, we are. It came about mostly when Kim was, um, so it's just been making a plan and ticking through that as we go. Um, and then obviously... When both myself and Kim got sick, we were either, you know, one man band at the time as well. So we both ended up with quite a bit of leave. So, um, yeah, we've got a plan just to, to tick through that as we can go. Right. Thank you. Okay. The recommendations is that the um, receiver of financial reports are circulated. I'll move that. Kathy, second. Okay. I think you still have the floor, Danielle. You're moving on to the project financial update and this oh. is from December yeah. so we're a month and a bit out yeah sorry it's not um, no, that's like, no, no, it's like, I just um, so I guess the key items here so um, what we've spent to date is 2.9 million of the 9.24 million budget um, the key bit I guess is the contingency so Variations to date is 244k out of 417, so we're 60% through our contingency. Um, we always knew this was light, though, so it's not too much of a surprise. Um, and now we'll just manage all these things very closely, and we hope we can get through a bit further with the contingencies, but we'll just have to see how it goes. Um, I guess, is there any other update you want to give, Reese, on the project? Or... Yeah, so so just on that, and I know most in here are um, in the steering group anyway, so you'll probably yeah. get more of an up-to-date brief in our upcoming steering group, which is on Wednesday. Mm. Um, yeah, that's probably the best place to touch on the detail, I think, unless anybody wants to know anything really specific. Um, I'll try and answer it. Some of it may be Penel questions. Um, yeah, unless anybody wants to know anything specific. Well, I'm comfortable waiting till Wednesday. Yeah, I'm happy to wait till um, Wednesday. Yeah, of course. 
Okay, so recommendations that we receive the information. I'll move that again. And Christine, the second. Yes. Okay, we're moving on to 4.4, which is Reese's report. No, is it, sorry, there's one more before that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Still me. Yeah. You're still um, cash flow forecast update. So can you still see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, oh, so I guess um, the main thing here is, so the last forecast is the screen line, updated is the dark blue. Um, we pretty much end up in the same place. There's just a bit really, of... Sorry, Daniel, are you only know, seeing the, the agenda? There's no... Oh, agenda. Okay. 4.3. Okay. Yeah, there's no, uh, the, the graph isn't up on the screen. Okay. Wait one second. that better? Oh, no. Now? Yep, thank you. Um, sorry, so the last forecast is this green line, um, updated is this dark blue. Um, so I guess the key bit is that we're still ending up in this last, uh, the same place. Um, with the Once we get the 50k overdraft in place, this will cover our shortfall um, just on the overdraft. So MOT has verbally agreed to it. We're just waiting for this in writing um, and then we'll be able to continue the process with the bank. Um, the timing, there's a bit of timing here because the auditors have still not audited us. So um, they're looking like they might be kind of April, May. Um, so that's pushing some expenses out. And then also, um, I guess Bruce will touch on this a bit more, but the cropping income we had in the forecast is a lot less. So, but this is mostly, well, this is all offset with um, less expenses. So we had quite a few extra costs on the December SOI, which is what I'm using as the basis of the forecast. Um, and I had a bit of uh, double up in the expenses of our tax expense. So that's the key bits. Um, also updated just with the SOI that we'll go through forward, the like the long term. Um, so it's looking um, quite good in the future, which is still the key. But we'll go through SOI a bit later. So that's Thank it. Is there any questions? No, I mean, it still looks more positive than it could do. So yeah. and we, we haven't quite snuck into the OD, but that will come. But thank you very much, Reese and Daniel, for the work. Oh. Yeah, I think it's probably just a reasonable time to note, um, you know, as we've gone into red level now, um, last weekend New Zealand did make it known to us and Sounds Air that the flight schedule will reduce, so it doesn't go away. Uh, it's nowhere near as bad as a level three or level four lockdown. Um, luckily with Air New Zealand, we're only losing uh, two flights a week, which is it's not too bad. Um, but that doesn't guarantee us, obviously, the passenger numbers. Um, given red, some people may be less inclined to travel and things like that. So we may see a further dip in flights. Um, Sounds Air is the same. Actually, for the first time, they've reduced their schedule, um, which kind of goes to show what's going on. Um, again, they, they still maintain a schedule, um, but they are not overnighting anymore at our airport, which um, does throw up a few additional things. Um, the overnighter was really good because it allowed a an early morning flight to Wellington and you could potentially do a business day down in Wellington and come back on the evening flight. Um, obviously without the overnight capability anymore, that is going to minimise that. So, you know, the appeal of that Wellington link may lose a little bit with people who are wanting to do a business day. Um, obviously it's not forever, but it is something that we need to keep working with sounds on and um, reviewing how we go forward. Because uh, obviously we're all involved in this and obviously TDC does um, guarantee a few of those seats as well. So it, it is a three-way conversation um, about how we move forward and how long that looks uh, with Sounds Air. Thank you. Now, Shady, did we um, pass 4.3? I can't remember. Um, through you, the chair, no, you haven't yet. Okay. So the recommendation that we receive the cash flow forecast. So... Christine, I'll second. Thank you. Right, well, Reese, moving on to you to receive your report. You're muted. Sorry, I'm back. Uh, I'm just going to try and screen share. Stand by.
Right, can you all see that? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, my first item that I want to talk about is landing fees and um, what that does for, for our airport. So uh, obviously the, the last time we looked at landing fees was way back um, around 2014. Um, so it's been a fair while since we've actually reviewed our landing fees. And we did go through an exercise in the investigation stages of the terminal car park apron upgrade around passenger fees at the airport and what Air New Zealand pay us per passenger, um, which was renegotiated prior to the works starting as part of that investigation work. Um, in the meantime, I've put our hand up with NZ airports and a whole heap of airports around Australia to kind of collaborate on. Uh, what it costs to facilitate these aircraft um, based around specific aircraft. So instead of just going on the blanket, you know, comparing Auckland Airport to Telpo, there's going to be some big differences, right? Because they facilitate different aircraft. But we all have the same costs facilitating a Q300, uh, an ATR72, A300, things like that. So it was really good collaboration between airports across Australia and New Zealand. Um, not all of them have done this. Um, it's just the ones that have put their hand up for it really good for us um, because it shows us where we sit in the market versus what it's costing us to actually operate the same aircraft. So as you can see from this chart here, um, we've got all the Australian airports and New Zealand airports in it. And there we are right down the bottom, $2.83. Uh, the only one cheaper than us is Hokitika. So that kind of goes to show we're, we're quite far behind the eight ball. Uh, in terms of operating costs based on our Q300 aircraft service, so the Auckland Telco Link um, with Air New Zealand. So obviously with our new terminal, this is going to jump up to around the $6 mark, so we'll be sitting here. But in the meantime, all these other ports are actually also going to jump up as well. So even our revised pricing is still going to be really, really light. Um, based around what it still costs us to operate, um, it's probably due a complete review process as well. So this isn't just our landing fee as such. I'm talking, we, we go one step further and we review all of our general aviation landing fees, what it costs, our bulk fees that we offer. Um, so most of our operators who are based on the airfield commercially choose to pay bulk landing fees. I think what we need to do is go through an exercise where we actually review this in its entirety. So I'll just scroll down to general aviation. So they did the same exercise here. So they've used Cessna 172 as a benchmark uh, for general aviation, reason being that that's probably the most common general aviation aircraft around. Um, so again, you can see we are right at the bottom on this one. So um, you can kind of discount these ones up because obviously they're big international Australian airports and. The reason these numbers are so massive is that a 172 can't actually legally fly into them. So if they do, it's special. And all that kind of stuff. But $18, so more than double what we are. Um, even the likes of some of the Northland airports, Timaru is often an airport compared close to ours, and, and they're still $2 more. So again, that what I would like to kind of float is the idea of getting into a landing fee review and um, using some of this data that we've got here, working with the likes of NZ Airports, um, who we are members of, so we, we get all this kind of stuff for free, um, is to actually get into a bit of an in-depth review and um, put a time scale on things, which I can probably come up with some ideas for the next meeting um, and update you on you know, what's involved, how long it will take, and kind of what outcomes we would expect. So. What's the committee's thoughts on it, um, looking at these? And I'm happy to send this draft to you individually if you want to go through it. Mm -hmm. what, what is, Reese, Cathy here, does this pose any risk to us? If, if um, review goes ahead and, and we make a decision to lift our landing fees, which obviously need to be uh, when you see our current financial position, um, but does that pose any risk at all to us as an airport? I wouldn't say it poses any risk as such. Uh, I think if we do the process properly and we have 
um, clear workings for our reasoning. So say we came to a higher number on certain landing fees, if we could show um, evidence and proof of why we've come to that number, then I don't think there really is much risk. People may complain anyway. Um, I guess that's just the nature of it. But I mean, for my argument, you can see our, our bottom line is on a downward trend. And, you know, for both general aviation and passenger fees, we are way at the bottom. Um, you know, on our passenger landing fees, we are substantially at the bottom. So something's got to give, right? Um, mm -hmm. We've kind of adopted this user pays model rather than asking the rate payers to subsidise the airport, which, you know, if we keep on the trend we're going, that's going to be the case. So it, it brings into question paid car parking. Um, and with that, I think landing fees traditionally are our bread and butter. We are an airport. So we really need to review these, if nothing more than the fact that we haven't done it since 2014. So um, risk, I, personally, I would say there's more risk in actually not doing it and continuing to fall behind the wayside um, rather than actually reviewing something that we need to do and getting into a cycle of it. We should probably be reviewing these every five years anyway, just as BAU, just to know where we sit in the market and um, whether we're tracking ahead or behind. I totally oh, agree you. with you, Rhys. Um, I did bring this up with um, the old manager that we needed to review it because it was for the five years. So I think everything you've said is exactly right. If we follow a due process, engage with the stakeholders and have the methodology and the facts behind us, it is just part of running a business. So I'm totally in favour of, um, can we do it in-house or do you have to engage an outside person? So we'll collaborate with NZ Airports because obviously they do a lot of stuff for us for free because we're members. So we can get a lot of data such as this, you know, this didn't cost us anything. Um, and it gives us a really good benchmark. So we could then narrow out certain airports of interest, such as, say, Timaru, Hawke's Bay, um, other, north, you know, Northland ones, Rotorua, Tauranga, and work with those airports through NZ Airports to kind of gauge where we are in the market and what we deem as best. So it'll be a bit of work in-house and a bit of collaboration with external parties. Christine, your thoughts? No, I think we should do that work. I'm really happy with that. No, I agree it should be a regular. We should be reviewing it regularly. I'm surprised we haven't, but I'm glad we're going to. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so I, I think, think that's that the final part of the task that you've taken on in the last year and a bit, Reese. To be fair, you've done the committee's master plan, and this is the final part. So this is just part of um tidying up all the loose ends that you were handed two years ago. Yeah. So I think if we come up with a process for this um, that can be copy and pasted every five years, it should be fairly simple. And it's, we're not reinventing the wheel here. Every airport does it. We're just a bit behind on doing it ourselves. So, um, yeah, I, I think it would be a really good thing to get in, you know, underway. Well, the, the consensus is that we need to do it. So I think it's a, a yes for everyone around the table. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so a second bit. So I'll just get it off. And Reese, if you can send that to us, that would be great. Just so that it we would. Got, we can yep. we can't really see the numbers on there. So that's all right. I can send it out that. if anybody wants it. Um, I'll I'll just um. Yeah, I might flick it to Shaney if that's easiest. Yeah, she can that's just great. To everybody. Um, there, is, there is far more detail in there, and it does go through. Um, they targeted at regional airports, so it goes from A320s down to general aviation, so you can just filter out what you don't need to read. But, um, yeah, the, the whole review process is really good, and it actually documents where we sit in the market versus everywhere else, um, which is really cool. And it shows our costs, you know, associated with operating these aircraft. Um, so next thing is a pretty brief touch on, but um, as part of the master plan discussion and just getting conversation started early, um, we have quite a bit of interest in zone D, uh, which is our rotorcraft area. Um, so we've got three people who are pretty much ready to pull a pin um, and go ahead with building uh, helicopter facilities in 
the area on our master plan mapped as zone D. So that was the rotorcraft area to the northwest of the new terminal. Um, so two of them are quite big operators. One is a very community-driven operator, a uh, charitable trust, you can probably guess who that is. Um, and the other is a current tenant who is looking to not only expand, but um, build new facilities with it. Uh, the third person is a um, lighter commercial user, um, but they do do flight training, uh, which is, you know, you could deem it as a community thing as well, because flight training is obviously a, a good thing to bring, especially with rotorcraft. Um, helicopters getting harder and harder to get hold of, and flight training is becoming less and less around the place. It would be quite good if somebody was to set up an official flight training facility at our aerodrome. So I'm in the early stages of discussing with these guys. We do have sites lotted out on Zone D as part of work we've done way back in the piece. Um, they've showed interest in areas they want. So the next phase really is to collaborate with them around what floor plans they have and also what we need to do um, to facilitate that and then working it into budgets and timeframes and things like that. Um, there may be an element here that we can collaborate with TDC because there is TDC land right on the back of that. Um, and I actually believe early investigation work by Flash was done um, to look at lots on the other side of this, which may benefit TDC as well. So um, a bit of collaboration to do, but really positive. Um, you know, to see growth at our airport this time is exactly what we wanted. You know, with the master plan being designed, it's kind of that um, you show people that you're willing to investigate their ideas and they will come and you know, three people were saying, I've got the money, I've got the plans right now. Like, we can go as soon as you say. So really positive in that, in that space. So it's, um, uh, we'll, and, and we'll, good we'll, place to you'll come back to us with more detailed um, requirements? Yeah, look, there's going to be a bit of work around budgeting and, you know, working with the likes of engineers. And Kevin will probably be a good person to pull into that with his background as well. Um, so, yeah, there'll be a bit of collaboration. I'll obviously have to sit down with Danielle and we'll put this stuff into financials as we move forward. Um, it's not going to be an immediate thing, obviously. There's quite a bit of work to do, but it is the starting piece of, of getting that area underway, which is really good. Thank you. Um, so next item is just about the transition from the current terminal building to the new terminal building and the car park. Um, and really an early conversation piece around starting the thought process um, between where we operate now and how we'll operate in the new facilities. So um, obviously we all know it's coming and we all have a rough idea of practical completion. Mm. You've Project, just... but the piece in the middle, sorry, second. You will just lag, there's a bit of lag going on, so I'm not yeah. sure. I think we missed that first start. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Cool. Okay, so sorry, just to go back, it's about the transition between our current terminal building and the new one and how we do it and, you know, what we do to do that. So early in the piece again, but myself and Kim are working together just to work out, you know, what we need to do and kind of timeframes we need between practical completion of the facilities to um, opening it and actually facilitating passengers and commercial operators out of that building. Um, so coming into that conversation again, you know, you'll recall uh, kind of late 2020, we had a discussion around our operators and our contractors who provide services to the airport at the moment. Um, I did note that we we are quite contractor heavy um, across a broad range of things. And I do genuinely still feel we can probably narrow things down and refine things a little bit better than what we do at the moment. It is a little bit messy. Um, and if, if you were to write an operations manual on what we do at the moment, it probably wouldn't be uh, as simple as it could be. So all of those things into the conversation, it's not just about what goes into the new terminal, but um, how we operate that new terminal, budgets for operating it, you know, what's it gonna cost us um, in the future. Um, who's going to service the car park, that kind of stuff. Um, who's going to you know, do the cleaning, so on and so forth. So really, I think we'll get into those conversations through this year as we start you know, progressing things with the terminal. Uh, we'll really start putting that on the front foot and talking about 
how we're going to do things, when we're going to do things, um, and, and working out budgets to go in line with that. Christine? Um, can I ask you, Rhys, the communication with the whole project, and I know we're talking about the transition of the terminal, but is the communication with the whole project going well from your perspective? Yeah, it is, yeah. So, I mean, as an example, we've just had a meeting prior to this with Kevin and Pinnell. Uh, so that's, you know, just an update on the steering group, uh, what, what we're doing going forward, how the project's tracking. Um, I think once Pinnell's come on here, it's actually become really good. Um, our comms are great. Um, you know, I, I'm meeting maybe three times a week with Pinnell. Um, email communication is good. So, you know, there's not necessarily everything I have to be involved in, but I, I usually know about it anyway. Um, it, if yes, that's it's relevant, then yeah. it's coming back through here. So, um, yeah, and obviously the steering committees, obviously it feels like we've had a bit of a break because of Christmas and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it yeah. does feel like a while since any updates have come through. But um, I feel the steering committee process is working quite well. Um, we're, we're getting pretty good information coming through. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm pleased about that. Thank you. No problem. Um, so the last bit on my list um, is actually to do with this committee agenda. So just something I've been working through. And obviously, every five years, we were audited by the CAA on our um, 139. So our 139 certification gets audited every year by CAA. Part of that is obviously our Part 100 safety management certification. Um, so just doing a bit of work because we'll have to kind of put our brains to this kind of mid this year, towards the end of this year, to make sure we're set for next year's audit. Um, so the committee agenda and how we um, get information to you guys as per a requirement in our 139 and our Part 100 certification, which is that safety management and incidents, risk registers and all that kind of stuff are shared with the committee. Um, so, like I look at the agenda today, there's no element here where we have health and safety as such. I mean, that's probably the wrong term to use for what we do, but safety management more so. Um, so, I would like to kind of float the idea of coming up with a draft template for our agenda um, for this meeting and getting everybody's thoughts on it to include things like what incidents we've had or risk register updates. So if anything's changed on our risk register, if there's any new risks or any risks that no longer are relevant, um, that's all stuff that the CAA need to see reported and communicated with, with this committee. Um, you know, because we don't have a board, we have a committee of council, um, so they deem it in the same same light, really. So um, that that's kind of the big ticket item is to, to look at putting a, a safety element in our meeting. And the way I'd kind of do it behind the scenes is we have weekly safety management meetings. Uh, so that's myself, Kim, and safety manager, Steve Peterson. Uh, Steve would draft up the items in our meetings and we'd all agree on them. And then I would simply talk to them um, as per this, but in a separate window, separate agenda item outside of the GM report. So, um, Reese, in the past, obviously, we've had that under the confidentials. Will yeah. that will that continue, or will that just be part of the general um, agenda? Yeah, I mean, I I don't see any issue necessarily having it in the general agenda. Um, you know, risks are risks, and you know, actually putting them out there to me is a better thing. Uh, we're not hiding anything. Um, there may be elements of discretion required on certain incidents, um, and that may be outside of us. You know, it may be a request of police or, or other authorities, um, which we can always put into a confidential item if we need to discuss it further. But more so what I'm meaning is that we can go, you know, this month we've had X, Y, Z incidents. Um, none of them have had repercussions on TAA. However, it's flagged that we have additional risks A, B, and C moving forward. That's the kind of thing I would expect um, to bring to this meeting. So it's a high level discussion. If there's anything required in detail, we could review that on a case by case basis and decide whether it's worthy to talk in general or whether that has to go into a confidential discussion. It was an, it was an agenda item with Mike when 
the SMS was set up. So mm. it's, it's reactivating that. Okay. Yeah, I do remember like seeing it in the early days um, yeah. as part of our agenda item. So it would, it would be quite good to put that back in. Yeah, no problems from us. No, I think. no agree. Um, I, I would certainly suggest you touch base with possibly Michelle McGill. Uh, at council because I know that um, she has a very good template which is often um, used for uh, council um, yeah. presentations. So can I suggest That's that? Yeah. Very good. Anything else, Reese? That or any the discussions around the Lucerne will be at the SOI discussion? Yep. So discussion around the Lucerne will be the SOI. So there is okay. a bit, I'm still working with those guys on a bit of clarity on a few things. Um, there's been some discrepancy between what we believe and what they believe um, was the go. So I did catch up with them on Friday um, with the contract and just kind of ran through a few things and asked for their feedback. So hopefully I'll get something back in the next day or two um, to be able to provide you with an update. Yeah, I think the contract was drafted by the council team so, and you're just going back to fine tune that? Yeah, it's just refining and it's just making sure we're clear on the terms. Um, you know, I know I felt like I was pretty clear on things, but in talks and, and you know, what I've seen from them, maybe we weren't. And that, that's not just around financial, there's been some operational stuff that um, I've had to pull them up on um, that I've just not been totally clear on. And I've discussed this with Kim as well, and she was on the same page as me. So I think it's just a bit of communication or misunderstanding between the two parties yeah, it, um, it all so yeah end. i just want to clear yeah. that up before we kind of float how well we're doing sorry say right. again. no it all it all came quite um i think it was quite tight at the end of december because i had to get started so you've caught your breath and just tidy up a few no that's fine by me yeah so um 4.4 that we receive um reese's report so i'll Christine and I'll second it. Thank you. Okay, now into the actual nitty gritty and forward planning. Okay. Statement of intent. You've done quite a bit of work, Reese, with Daniel. Thank you. Have you had a chance to look at it, team? Okay. So who's going to talk for the show or Danielle? I think we'll both collaborate a little bit. Okay. Uh, so that's all right with Danielle. Have you got there to share, Daniel? Um, do you want to do you have the agenda up? Because I was thinking if you start with that, because the numbers are at the end, and then I'll share my screen. So that's all right. Well, if we're going to start from the top, can I talking to the committee about you know in the SOI talks about the governance and, and structure? Um, I think it's time that we got some clarity as to what this committee is going to do going forward. I'm very mindful that come October or prior to, how many weeks prior to October, the elections, that this committee is suspended. And it would be nice to have some more indication of how we're going to structure this next year, especially for Reese's point of view. So you um, mean around the possibility of a CCO? Yeah, because it's in the SOI, because it's been in there that we flagged this and, and it was put on hold because of the past year, but I, I just get mindful that come October that there is no one, there's no committee in it and it takes till February, if not March, the following year, and then it's locked and loaded for three years. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go through this for another three years where, it's, where the direction is a bit lost because the opportunity is right here now for the airport to move into the, the next 10 to 50 years. So, Shaney, I... I... Do you want to comment on that, the process for it to become a CCO? Um, I, I think I wasn't involved in work on that, sorry, so I'd have to go away and have a look at it. Um, but, yeah, that is correct that at the elections in October, the committees will be disestablished and then the incoming council will consider the committee structure at, at that point. Um, yeah, we so, yeah, so, so through, through the chair, we're just, um, Kevin here, um, oh, Reese, Reese and I have been discussing this uh, for a little while. We've just had a, um, a bit of a, a hooey on the, the master plan, and this was next on it. So what I think we can take away from this is uh, Reese and myself will get together 
and come up with a bit of a project plan over the next month or two, and we'll put it on the agenda for the, the following committee meetings after that. So it's on, certainly on our radar. We just didn't want to overload Reese with all the stuff and the COVID and everything else that we've got. Um, but we do want to have a, a forward way um, plan moving ahead. Um, we're happy to do that either the next meeting or the one after that. Thanks, Chris. No, that's good. Because, I, I mean, I believe that if the information comes out of it for the next council to decide, that gives some certainty that um, we don't lose time and, and, and missed opportunities. So thank you. Yeah, so through the chair again, just one, one key thing was just really understanding their master plan, where we wanted to head, and then the statement of ten all ties into that. So we're, we're doing it in sequence. Um, it's a little bit slower than what we'd, we'd thought, but um, we, you know, um, to be fair, the airport with the project and other things, it's just taking priority on this, Chris. No, no, all good. Thank you. Through the chair, can I ask how hard is it, or maybe with what Shaney said, Kevin, Kevin might know, how hard is it to make it a CCO? Is it, a, is it just preparing the paperwork and the council making that decision, or is it bigger than that? Uh, without getting into the yeah, it's just through the chair, sorry, Christine, it's, I don't know, I'd have to get into the detail, and we'd be better placed for that next month to answer that question, because I've done... I've done creation of CCOs and other councils for different ones, um, and some of them have been really straightforward, and others I've mean have been incredibly complex. I don't know where this one sits, sorry, without getting into detail. So if I, I can just put my um, knowledge in. So we are actually a CCO on paper. So yeah. TAA is, is a CCO um, on paper for reporting. So I think more of the discussion here is about making sure our structures align. Um, and that's just more like, the whole wider piece, um, not just CCO, but you know how the 139 and the part 100 fits into our org structure. Um, you know how M MOT and TDC and TAA all interact. You know, there's there's a whole big wider piece, I think, of work there. So, so, yeah. so through the, through the chair, recently I had a discussion, and um, the, the CCO is is a, a solution, um, and we just wanted to make sure that we're dotting our eyes and crossing our t's and making sure it is the optimal solution and what choices we actually have around that solution. So that's the rule for the general model. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. That's a great update. Sorry, guys, we can continue through the... Okay. So Danielle's going to screen share uh, the SOI. Uh, it may just be easier if she's talking numbers that she can... Sorry, that's just bear with me, I've um, lost... And then I can interject my part. That's right. I've got mine here if you need me to. Can you see that? Yep. Yep. Um, so it's all standard. So we just talked about the structure. So I guess, Reese, do you want to talk about this part? These sort of do you want me to talk about the first bit? Yeah. Yep, so if you could just go back up to the introduction. Scroll up. Yep, so that. So everyone can see that okay? Yes. Yep. yep. Excellent. So this is just a part of it. Part of it I've amended to be more aligned with our structure as it is now. So previously, um, it had reference to myself reporting to the CEO of the council. Um, it didn't really have any reference to a council controlled organization as defined by the local government act which we already are on paper so i think it's important that we note that uh, here and then also just the reference to how taa is managed as a jv um is in that paragraph as well so short and sharp but i think it, it's more relevant now to what we are rather than um what these sois were in the past we could scroll down a bit so again this bit has obviously changed as we've moved forward um, so a lot of talk obviously about terminal parking apron development but also if you could just scroll down a little bit as well please and therefore what um, yeah there we go that should be all right there so obviously the first bit here is about our growth, and this is pretty much the story of how we, the reasons why we needed it, and how we got there. So working with Ebbers um, to do those 
um, investigation pieces. If you could go down a page, please, Danielle. So those first paragraphs are just about that. Then as we go through, we discuss about um, extra revenue streams that we've looked at. So expanding on our revenue, given that COVID came about. Um, so things like cropping and the reference there to um, the work we're doing with back paddock silage. Um, there's also a reference in here about precinct D, as I spoke about earlier, uh, about the potential to develop that for helicopter use. Um, and then really there's the last main bit is about future development. Um, looking into, so something we've been talking about is underwing refueling. So we, we don't have underwing refueling at the moment, and it's a re major reason why we don't actually accept in New Zealand divert flights. Um, geographically, we're in a great place to accept diverts from Hamilton, Tauranga, Rotorua, and Palmerston North. But the reason we can't is because we can't actually refuel their aircraft. So we get cut off the list. Um, so we did some initial investigation work working with ABP, um, who are in New Zealand's main supplier around what it would cost to uh, install underwing refueling. Now, it's not a major um, undertaking in terms of physicalities. There's a bit of a cost, but uh, it would be really good to actually investigate this a bit further in the future because it would mean that our passenger income would increase, our landing fees would increase if we start taking divert flights from other ports, especially given the fact that our weather for the most part, because we are the highest uh, commercial aerodrome in the Southern Hemisphere, our weather is a lot better than these other ports. Um, so Road Aurora as an example, is quite often fogged out in winter. Uh, we would be a great diver being only an hour away by road. Uh, if we could refuel, it's a great business case for us. So we've just put reference in there that we will be looking at, at you know, these other revenue streams or these potential developments for our airport moving forward. Go down a little bit. Please so governance and structure is, is really in line with what we are now and it's kind of in line with what I said in the introduction there. Um, there is reference to a section where uh, a couple of years ago there was some work done by a third party consultant to look at our uh, governance structure um, and they made recommendations around CCOs and things like that. Um, but again, we'll, we'll pick this up in the future. So performance targets basically remain the same. Um, don't see any differences there. Yeah, that's all the nitty gritty. Do you want to talk about the financial elements, Danielle? Yeah, yeah. So I'll actually, um, sorry, am I still on mute? No. Um, I'll go through a presentation of this, but I guess, because it's there's quite a few changes that have, coming up with the new terminal, um, but high level we're looking at, so this is a deficit of 212K um, for the 2023 year. Um, note in here that there is depreciation of 355, so cash flow will still be positive um, of about 143K. Um, and then for the next year, 100. 84 deficit um, with cash flow being 258 um, positive and again 82k deficit and 355k um, positive cash flow without capex. Um, so just to kind of because this is a whole lot of numbers I'm just I'm just going to Try and share a different screen. Can you see that? Oh, no. Can you see that? Sorry, I'm not used to using Zoom. Um, so I guess just to visually show how we would get from, so if you take the 2021 actuals of revenue, we were uh, 442K um, of revenue and to get to the 677k that we had in the 2023 so I is just breaking it down and showing what the major kind of differences are so 
Um, Race has already talked about the passenger fees, so that's two dollars twenty to six dollars seventy per passenger. Um, car park income, so once the new terminal's finished, um, we've based this on. So this is obviously still to be decided, and we'll have to discuss in another meeting. But based on eight dollars a day and sixty percent occupancy, um, so that gives us an eighty-seven k a year income. Um, I know that in the past we've talked about the $5 a day, but when, now that we've got an idea of the cost of the terminal, which will be in the next slide, or not the terminal, sorry, the car park, um, the $5 a day just won't really cut it. Um, flight volume, so we've actually based this on the current schedule. So um, I don't know whether with the update, race with the two, two flights less from New Zealand and sounds here, this actually might be a bit high now because um, this is more in line with 2019. But again, we're talking about July 2023. So to know and to June 2024. So it's it's very hard to predict what we'll, what we'll be like with COVID. So this was based on yeah current schedule as it stands without COVID reductions. Yeah, um, I think that's a fair assumption. Obviously, we're looking into the future here and things at the moment are constantly going up. Yeah. And and, um, losing two flights a week isn't as drastic as going into a lockdown where we get nothing. So um, I think we're still fairly close in the ballpark. And as you said, it's pretty hard to forecast this stuff anyway, isn't it? Because you, you just don't know what's going to happen with COVID and restrictions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, lease income, so we've um, increased it um, with the CPI and valuations. Cropping income, so this is based on just areas one to three income, and that's only eight grand a year. Um, and last year, we in the 2021 year, we had 4K of income, so that's only a 4K increase there. Um, landing fees, again, we only just received that report so we put in a five percent increase because we knew that they were light um but that is looking like it's quite a conservative estimate so we would actually expect that to be quite a bit higher so that might make up for any loss that we had to have due to covid um and i've put that in just from once the terminal finishes to kind of hopefully we'll have that review done by then and um i think it'll be quite a nice time with so as, as, as Danielle said on the, the landing fees, <clears throat> we had populated this prior to getting the results back from that um, that study. But the number looks more like we should probably be looking at a 15% increase um, to put us in the ballpark of everybody else. Mm. Um, that, that's kind of how it felt. I think the car park is another thing worth mentioning. Um, as Danielle said, you know, we initially talked about like this $5 a day number. There was no real workings behind that. That was kind of like a feeling out sort of number. Um, I've actually done the same exercise with NZ airports around the car park income as we did with our passenger landing fees. So we should get some similar data back that will show where we sit in the market around an airport car park. Um, I would imagine even on an $8 a day number, we would be still way down the bottom, which in this case probably isn't a bad thing. It's just as long as we are covering our costs and um, making it a viable exercise. And um, so yeah, that's the income just for the 2023 year. And um, is there any questions on that? No, that's all straightforward. Cool. Um, and again, just visually showing um, the to the 2024 and the 2025 year. So. Um, because we only have six months of the new terminal, you just got another six months of increased passenger fees and car park. Um, we the the lease sites that Reese mentioned to so the zone D, um, we actually had this in the 2024 um, year for the SOI. Do you think Reese that that is still reasonable, or do you think that needs to be pulled forward? No, I think that's still reasonable. Okay. So still think we keep it there. Um, and then, yeah, just standard lease CPI increases. Um, and again, landing fees just a third six months. 
Um, and then we get to the expenses. So again, um, so the 2021 actuals was um, around, around 1 million and 86,000. Um, we had a lot of impairment for the building. So you take that out, um, professional fees will be um, a bit less. Um, just because we had the um, the runway valuation and also the OLS. OLS. Um, but then we'll have our runway surface conditioning report um, this time, this coming year. Um, depreciation obviously increases once we start depreciating all this new terminal and car park. Um, cropping, so there is this again, as uh, as Ruth mentioned, this is still in discussions, but in the contract at the moment, there are costs there for us to put in for developing um, kind of just uh, the areas still one to three, so there's an area of four and five, um, and then we're put in the car park, so the equipment lease and the service agreement. Um, so this is six months worth of cost for 28k and then also we've kind of tried to put in a rough estimate of what we what things might increase with the new terminal so there'll be increased cleaning and wi-fi and um, gardening etc so obviously it's hard to know on security and things um, it's hard to know without it actually already happening but we've put in some cost there um, I guess, is there any questions on that? No. Nope. Um, yeah, so that just gets to the SOI number of 889,000. Um, and again, it's very similar so to get to the 2024 number. So we've, we've actually put in some taxiway maintenance um, for 40K there. Um, this will hopefully align with when we're doing the apron expansion as part of the development. Um, the commercial development for the lease site, so that's just any upfront costs that we need to do water connections or um, valuations and anything to do with those new helicopter sites. Um, obviously, this is very much an estimate of 20K. Um, again, more cropping expenses. Um, more depreciation and a further six months of the car park new terminal fees um, and 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 here doesn't include capital expenditure so for the 2024 year we'll have that for an expansion um, any questions no so that just gets to our um, SOI 2024 SOI number of one million and 95,000 um, and then in the 2025 year we won't have um, a whole bunch of these costs um, to, with the development kind of side of things um, and this gets us to the one million dollars of expenses in 2025. Um, capital expenditure that we've kind of forecasted would be the underwind refueling, if that looks like it's going to be a good option, and also improved boundary fencing. Um, now, I did just one point that we didn't cover in the wording. So, um, just on page 44 of the agenda, so we've um, put in there that the joint venture six conversation for funding up to 800 from TDC for the redevelopment project prior to December 2023. So this is just to cover the shortfall that we have in the terminal um, for the essentially the apron cost, um, which I'm sure everyone knows. So we've, we've pulled that apron cost and put it into the terminal. Um, and then also just the apron enabling works that we um, are currently doing. So that's about 30k um, that we need to do now um, while we're doing the terminal works and because otherwise that would come out of the contingency. So these items will be part of that discussion in the steering group around. 
um, how we're tracking on budget and things like that. Mm. Um, is there any questions from the number side of things? No. Thank you for your work, Reese and Danielle. It's, I mean, it's crystal ball gazing, really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I definitely think, um, you know, the SOI is, is now quite a good reflection of where we're aiming to be. Um, you know, it's quite a different document than it used to be, so... There's been plenty of people involved in it too. Okay, so the recommendation that we accept the draft statement of intent, which will obviously go to full council for total sign off. So do we have, yep, there we go, Christine and, and Kathy, thank you very much. Chair, yeah, can I just make a comment? Um, we did some, oh, I really like the statement of intent, but we did some strategic work last term. And in it, we developed a vision statement. You know, I'm always going on about such things, but they are important. And I think we need to review whether we still agree with that vision statement, but I think it should be heading that document. And I don't care if they put vision statements in statements of intent or not, but a lot of the work you're doing is contributing to the vision we came up with. So if it still applies, I believe that it needs to be in there but does it still apply? That work we did was quite considerable and a lot of thought went into it and a lot of it is still appropriate. In fact, we've done some of the things that we decided on and I think there's a strategy in that document that we've just approved and it should have that vision statement in there if we still agree with it. It was quite an exciting one and it would appeal to a lot. It was about being the best little airport in New Zealand and it's more powerful than you think. Some of it's in the, the first paragraph of the strategic focus, you know, some of the wording from that. that yeah, but the vision statement itself is not, and that usually leads most organisations. I still think that the, the statement itself is very important because everything you do should refer back to that. So I still think it's, it, it's an important piece of work that we did. Reese, can we, you've got access to that from the past can we yeah. upgrade that in the first paragraph i think one day Absolutely. we just have to review yeah. that we we do still agree with that i mean it was pretty simple but but still aspirational and if we do agree with it i think it needs to be on our documents yeah well i do think it's still relevant um as the first question you know we we um we've taken spoken about this in the past and i definitely still think that you know, hence why it's in the strategic focus and um, we do have our vision, you know, our, the key points of our vision statement in the strategic focus. So, yeah, putting it at the top around that in introduction, I, I can't see it being a bad thing. Um, Christine, do you want to organise within what time frame for a, a focus group? Because I'm more than happy. I think it, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I, I definitely think we should be reviewing it. We should be reviewing it regularly. Maybe we could attach it to the next meeting or we could have a special meeting in between, like in a month or so. Well, if we actually get down to a face-to-face -face where we can brainstorm over this that for would be two hours, wonderful. than trying to do it over the computer. Yeah, it is much harder on Zoom. Okay, shall we try and organise that within the next six weeks? That would be fabulous. Surely, is that a possibility to schedule a time? <laughs> Sorry, yes, we'll um, schedule that as an action to a, a workshop in the next six weeks. Great, thank you. thank you. Put something in the diary. Okay, so anything else, team? No. Thank you, Kevin, for your input. Um, Reese, Shani, Danielle, and Christine and Kathy. I think we're through some very difficult times. You look back at what we've achieved. That's pretty phenomenal, actually. We kind of beat ourselves up that we're not moving at fast pace, but actually what Reese yeah. has achieved in, in the, his first year and then into his second has been extraordinary, actually. Mm -hmm. So we are, the airport has not gone backwards, it's gone forwards. So thank you, Reese. Absolutely true. And yeah. thank you, Chair, too. Yeah. No. Right, no, thank you very much, team. Yes. Meeting has finished.
Okay. Bye, Thanks. everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.